Hey, this is Matthew from Nerd News Today, and joining me on the other side of the screen, you know him from X-Ray Films, he's the man behind the new documentary all about the art of Dungeons & Dragons, Eye of the Beholder, as well as some other very geeky films and interesting stuff, and that man is Brian Stillman. Brian, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me on. I love the Albear hat, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Albear Appreciation Society. We appreciate them much more than they appreciate us. And we're very extra big on Albears these days because we just talked to Brian Volkweiss recently, and uh, his company, the Nacelle Company, picked up Eye of the Beholder, and he was telling me how yep. much he loves Albears. So I think you're responsible for that, aren't you? I am. I am. I, I recently picked up, I keep it right on my desk here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the Albear. That was used, not literally this one, but this little plastic owlbear from the mid-70s was used by Gary Gygax uh, at his at his table to represent owlbears. And then uh, an artist named uh, Dave Sutherland used that to draw the owlbear that appears in the very first monster manual, the AD&D monster manual. Um, and that's the owlbear. You can see it depicted on my hat. So it's this completely bizarre thing. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. It took me five years to get that thing. Um, <laughs> And um, I think that sort of Brian picked up on that, and uh, he tends to become very enthusiastic about different toys that cross his path. So it's my fault. Sorry, Brian. Well, I think it was five years very well spent. Uh, <laughs> right. And of course, you know, the Albert today in D&D looks very different, and that's kind of something that's yeah. uh, one of the things that your doc talks about, which is the evolution yeah. of the artwork in D&D and just the history of the artists, what the company was like, all that kind of great stuff. So uh, can you just tell us, for our viewers who don't know about Eye of the Beholder yet, what is it about? Uh, Eye of the Beholder, the art of Dungeons & Dragons, uh, is about the art of Dungeons & Dragons. We look at the art and artists uh, and the evolution of the art and the role the art plays, both in the game and also pop culture. Um, We talk to a lot of artists going all the way back to the earliest days of Dungeons & Dragons, um, but all the way up through today. We look at the art as a... Uh, sort of a continuity. We don't look at D&D art as this one moment in time. Um, it really is this thing that's ongoing. It's alive. It's continuously evolving. Um, it's both leading and following trends in fantasy art. Um, and uh, we're, the movie kind of celebrates all that. So what's uh, your personal connection to the game? Ah, oh, man. I've been playing uh, since the 80s. I grew up on first edition AD&D, played second edition, Stuck with both of those for a long time, um, and then kind of shifted over to fifth edition over the last few years. Um, so I've been I've been playing forever. Um, you know, well not forever for forever for me. You know, I was born in '75. I started playing probably around '82. Uh, a friend of mine, his older brother, had a bunch of D and D books, and he let my friend play with them and. We didn't fully understand the rules, but we, we kind of winged it. It's just something that connected with me really early on. It's so much fun. Uh, it's a cool chance to hang out with all your friends, to kill things. That's always the best, take, yeah. <laughs> take their loot. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the art was always very important to me. As much as I cared about the books for the game, to me, these were the places, these books were the places where I could go to see monsters, to see cool stuff that you got to remember back in the 80s, there's no internet, so we couldn't just type in, you know, weird monster and have stuff, you know, have 100 photos or 100 drawings to look at. You couldn't go to any museums. There are no museums covering this stuff. There were very few books that were devoted to this type of art. Um, You had book covers, you know, for fantasy novels, um, and you had D&D books, and occasionally the art of Boris or the art of Eagleton or the art of whoever but generally, there wasn't a ton of that stuff. D&D was the place to go. So my friends and I would go and hang out in Walden Books, you know, rest in peace, Walden Books, and uh, right, <laughs> pour one out. And we'd just hang out there and, like, flip through the pages and be like, oh, check this out. This is awesome. You know, what the hell's that? What's that going to do? Uh, just independent of the game. So it's all kind of wrapped up. So why did you decide to make this documentary in particular about those artists? And why did you want to honor them so much in this film? All that stuff I just described, all right? It occurred to me other people have to feel that way, too. You know, there are other people out there. I couldn't be the only person who was that sort of fanish about the art. And I looked around, you know, when I sort of got back into d and I'd been away for a few years. You know, life gets in the way. You don't get to play as much as you want. When I got back with 5th edition and I'm flipping through it and seeing all this amazing art, I started thinking about where can I go to learn more about this? I knew all the artists I grew up with. I knew... Easley and Clyde Caldwell and Keith Parkinson and Larry Elmore and Jim Rosloff and Dave Trampier and 
you know, Dave Sutherland and all these people and, and Jeff D and, 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 you know, Errol Otis, but I didn't know much about them. And I started looking around and I couldn't find too much about them. You know, there's some stuff on the internet, um, and whatever, but, um, so I started thinking nobody's really delved into this the way they've delved into the game itself. You know, there were books written about the game. Um, you know, there's, uh, there are, you can find stuff on YouTube where they talk about TSR and the history of the game, certainly on the internet, but nothing really dove deeply into the art. Um, so I figured, I figured it'd be a fun thing to do. I figured it'd be a way to bring together all these passions. And honestly, I just wanted to meet all these artists. I just wanted to get in there and, and, Here's my excuse to, like, knock on freaking Jeff Easley's door. <laughs> you know, it's mind-blowing. That's why we do stuff like this. And I was actually oh, asking totally. that, like, yeah. Like, what was it like for you as this big, giant fan to be walking into the homes of the artists who shaped the game that you played for so long and you loved to this day? I, I mean, it's it's indescribable. Um, you know, I made the movie with two partners. My co-director, Kelly Slagle. And uh, she and I and a guy named Seth Polanski, we all produced it. Um, she and Seth are Cave Girl Films. I'm X-Ray Films. And we're all gamers. We're all fans of the art. We're all passionate about different artists. So as we're going from artist to artist, it's just like, it's mind-blowing. You know, I, I've been a journalist for a long time. I've interviewed politicians. I've interviewed celebrities. I've interviewed gang members. I've, I've done all sorts of stuff. And nothing left me so kind of fanned out and tongue-tied as like getting to meet all these artists you just have to pinch yourself it's it's amazing so of and those they all, artists none of them proved to be like jerks you know that's the best part there's always that fear i worked for a music magazine for a long long time and you're always worried that when you meet musicians you admire they're going to just be total like pains in the ass or something and uh all the artists are just really cool and really friendly and and just happy to talk about this stuff so who was that one artist that just got you like so flustered that you couldn't even work for a few minutes? <laughs> um, only one. You meet them all beforehand. You get them on the phone. You talk to them. You try and meet them at conventions. You try and do things to kind of break that ice so that you are able to go in and do the interview um, a little more prepared, a little more comfortable. Um, you kind of want to know what you're talking about so you're not just rolling on it and, you know, wasting time when you've only got two hours, three hours, whatever, with with the person you're interviewing on camera. It was never a situation where I'd sit down with them and just be kind of completely out of sorts or something, because I'd already kind of worked through those issues. Um, when I met Jeff Easley, though, so Jeff was the first artist that I met who really had a, a strong impact on my childhood. You know, I, the, the, the version of the first edition books that I had were um, the ones that he did the recovers for, um, so it's first edition AD&D. Originally, the covers were by Trampier and Sutherland. Jeff came in. They redid the covers um, around 79, um, 78, 79. And um, so that's the stuff I grew up with. The first time I met him was at a convention called the LuxCon, which is all fantasy art, science fiction art. It's uh, halfway between an a art show and a symposium for artists. And um, I see him at a booth, and I go up to him, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to introduce myself. And I'm gonna get this out of the way because I want to interview him for the movie. We got to get this guy. It's Jeff freaking easily. I can do this. So I walked up to him. I was like, "So, Mr. Easley, my name's Brian Stillman. I'm a documentary maker, but I'm also a gamer. I'm a really big fan of yours. And you know, it'd be really important uh, if we could get you into our movie. It would mean so much." And I'm sort of going on and on and on. And finally, I stop and I take a breath and I look at him. And Jeff, Jeff is like the Sphinx. He's just sitting there and he just looks at me. He goes. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And I'm like, I don't really know if he means it or if he's just not really like, who's this weirdo? So I keep going and I keep rambling and I'm rambling and rambling and rambling and he's just sitting there rocking. And then finally he's like, sure, give me a call. <laughs> he gave me his number and that was it. And I was just... I was such a fanboy. I'm glad there's no recording of that. I don't think there's a recording of that. But now we have but. the story recorded, so everybody can know. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I've told the story before. I fully own my fandom. I just didn't want anyone to actually see the moment, which was <laughs> terribly embarrassing. <laughs> so what was something while filming the documentary that you learned, either about an artist or a piece of art that you never knew before? 
oh man, there's so much, you know. Um, we Going into it, we knew the basics and the history and the general sort of vibe, but things like um, how much of it was thrown away by TSR um, is, is sort of the shocking realization. And, and we heard that from a number of people talking about that and how much was just randomly rescued by people like Diesel LaForce who, who saw it happening and was able to get to there and, and save so much of it. That's definitely something that we weren't aware of, the extent of it. And then there's like the little behind the scenes stories, you know, about the interactions between the artists, you know, and, and you know, they, they would have uh, rubber band fights. I like that part, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, one day they just fired a rubber band and it skipped off of a piece of Easley's art, you know, and it was still wet, you know, painting he was working on. He wasn't there. And they freaked out and someone repaired it. Someone went in and painted over Jeff's art. And when Jeff came back from lunch or whatever, he didn't even know it, you know, so... Things like that, um, you know, it's those little stories that really stuck out. The disconnect between, you know, we talk about this in the movie as well, the disconnect between the marketing department and the art department. Um, Brahm told us a story about how the marketing department came in and wanted uh, them to paint something using their most expensive colors. And, you know, never mind if it's the right color for the painting, the fact that it was an expensive color, they wanted it to be used. Or to paint something using all the colors. Like, they need to get their money's worth. Um, totally insane stuff like that. Um, so it's a lot of those stories that really were, were surprising to us. And with so much footage, and you had to squeeze you know, all down to a very small amount of time, yeah. uh, can you tell us anything that was left on the cutting room floor that you wish was able to stay in? Um, well, that's what DVD extras are for. Um, <laughs> you know, down the road. Um, but... Uh, Tease us now so we can give you our money later. <laughs> um, let's see. A story about how the little figures like the owlbear I showed you were used to uh, come up with some of the other monsters in D&D. Um, we have extra stories from artists like Todd Lockwood, uh, Tony D. Trilizzi. We've got lots of stuff from them. Uh, little things from uh, early artists like Tom Wom. Um, so it's really a lot of just extended interviews and stuff that uh, we've been looking at and putting together, and a lot of them became extras that our Kickstarters got to see, our Kickstarter backers got to see a lot of those. It's a lot of stuff. I mean, we have, I'd say we have about an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, something like that, of, of good material. And then a lot of random footage of like, oh, I forgot to stop the camera. So it's like, oh, there's my feet as I'm walking along and stuff like that, which we're not going to include. Now, once you guys got everything done, the movie was ready to go. I assume mm -hmm. you showed it to all the artists who were in the movie. Uh, did yep. any of them have any interesting reactions to seeing themselves on screen? I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing over the top. Um, a few would make comments like, oh, man, I, I sound weird or whatever. But but generally, they all seem pretty pleased. Um, at least nobody's really um, said otherwise to me. Um, you know, it's uh, I think reaching out to them, most of them were happy that we thought of them. Um, and, and we're pretty humble about their involvement in this stuff over the years. I think they're all, honestly, I think they're all a little surprised the movie came out. Um, <laughs> you know, there are always projects floating around, and, and some of them get approached to do a lot of interviews. Janelle Jaquez, because she was heavily involved, um, and her wife is heavily involved in the video game industry over the last three decades, four decades, they do a lot of interviews uh, relating to that, relating to women in gaming, and, and all sorts of things. Um, not all of which come out. So she, I, I don't know what kind of odds she was giving us, but uh, uh, I think she took it with a grain of salt till we actually appeared. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not in the habit of making movies that don't come out. So it's, uh, we knew it would happen, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think she was pleasantly surprised. Well, I'm glad you guys got it to the finish line. It's a really great yeah. documentary. I enjoyed it. And Thank I know you. all the D&D fans out there as well are going to love taking a look at this thing. So if you haven't seen Eye of the Beholder yet, it's available on iTunes. And uh, where else can we find it? Oh, man, it's on iTunes. It's on Amazon. It's on PlayStation and Xbox and Vudu and uh, all sorts of, like, cable-on-demand services that I hadn't heard of. Um, it's uh, Vimeo. If you're international, the easiest way to watch it, or outside the U.S., I should say, the easiest way to watch it is Vimeo On Demand. Um because some of the other services hit some countries, but not every country. Nacelle has done a really good job. You know, Brian and his team, um, Anna Roberts and Kieran Dottie and 
Hannah Schwartz, and they've all done a really good job of of getting it out there. You know, when you're an indie filmmaker, you never quite know what's going to happen. You know, I did a movie before this called Plastic Galaxy, the story of Star Wars toys, and I, I put that out through a company called Gravitas, another distribution company, and they did a great job. Um, but uh, you never know if the next company you sign with is going to do the same amount of work. And everyone at Nacelle really, really stepped up to the plate um, to help spread the word. So they've gotten it out to just a ton of services, which I'm, I'm super grateful for. So there's basically no excuse not to watch Eye of the Beholder. If you don't do it, an owlbear's going to come and eat your face. Um, I mean, like it's an owlbear, so it's claw, claw, bite. And uh, so they might get you with the claws. It really kind of depends on on uh, how you decide to handle that one. 